Thank you. Hi, I'm Thomasina Myers, and I'm delighted to be here at Spring with Sky Gindel on behalf of Our La Pro and the Sustainable Restaurant Association, specifically to talk to you, Sky, about her incredible scratch menu. So we throw away a third of the food we grow in this country, which would otherwise feed 30 million people a year. Now, with the cost of living crisis going on at the moment, that is a terrifying stat. And Sky, eight years ago, yes. started doing something about this. Yes, we did in 2016, so we're almost coming up to eight years. We started something called the Scratch Menu, which is a food waste menu that we serve every evening between 5.30 and 6.30. And it's food that we use in the kitchen. I mean, I always, I'm very keen to say it's sort of not dumpster diving. I think it's like really beautiful quality food, but it's everything from actually with the dairy we make, uh, the, the spent coffee milk we make. For example, we often make lubni with it or things that we, the fish trims or fish bones or lovely peelings. And we try and turn it into a nutritious and delicious because that's incredibly important, a three course meal every evening. It's incredible because not only does it tick not throwing away that food, it would otherwise just go straight in the bin. So you're producing delicious restaurant quality food. As you say, nutritious. I think we lose that idea that food is supposed to nourish us yeah. and give us goodness. What I love about it, I tell my chefs about your scratch menu, it gives people access to quality of food that you serve here on a lesser budget. Exactly. I love that. That's actually it. For me, it makes spring feel a little bit more egalitarian. You know, and I know that we are an expensive restaurant in the middle of the West End and a lot of that is to do with we really do also believe in paying all our producers and suppliers properly and the ingredients and things are expensive to us as well and rightly so but it is lovely to know that people can come and eat three courses for £30. It's pretty reasonable. We also do scratch cocktails and all sorts of different things. Also I think one of the things that I also enjoy about it is that I don't write it which is a huge relief not to have to write a new menu every night but also it really gives the younger chefs in the kitchen an opportunity to think about creating menus, what works, what doesn't, and then also just to take pride and ownership over actually putting plates in front of people in a restaurant. What I love about the way you do it as well, you were describing it to me earlier, and I love one, the practicality of how you have this wonderful shelf in your walk-in fridge for all the things that would otherwise go in the bin. So then your commie chefs have got this plate, the whole thing to play with, a yeah. whole selection of things every day that they've got to kind of write a new menu for. So not only have you got the practical side of that, but then you've got this really creative side yeah. of that, of like, what am I going to cook with all this? I know, it is amazing. And actually, I'm so in admiration of what they come up with. You know, it is exactly, we've got a, we call it the scratch shelf. We put every single thing. So if we've finished filleting fish, we put any of the fish trim there. Once we've broken down meat, as well like we also put you know some of the meat trim or the fat there peelings from vegetables outer leaves of kind of things like cauliflowers or broccoli or you know like the ends of broccoli when we trim and the dessert section do it too which is really lovely so very often we use a lot of the vegetable peelings and we make you know they're full of pectin some of them mm. like apples and things and so you make apple syrups they come up with these really lovely menus and then we don't decide it till 4 30 in the afternoon so they've only really got an hour to do it as well and then it's been a hugely successful thing for for us which is really lovely because people really love the idea I mean the one thing I do say about it though and I make no apologies is we do no dietaries on that menu because otherwise it wouldn't be a true yes. food waste menu if you said oh I don't actually like fish and we go oh, don't worry about it we'll give you some meat we do say to people if you do have dietaries perhaps you'd be better to go to the a la carte menu which we will of course accommodate all your dietaries but actually on the scratch menu it really is potluck and we can't even tell you what it is before 4 30 in the afternoon occasionally you get a few grumblings but most most people are really up for it and I think they, I, I, I'm always amazed how people are so willing if you make it easy for them to jump on board a good something positive. It also really speaks I think to how all of us can lean in to this idea of food waste because I feel how I was brought up was to look in the fridge and first of all what are we going to have for dinner we're looking what is there in the fridge what needs eating and you scoop up everything and you make it into something delicious and I think nowadays because we've lost that connection with ingredients and, and also just simply how to cook that people don't have necessarily those skills but I feel isn't that exactly what we should be doing be, in a way it's easy not to throw away food if you're more connected to what is in your fridge and you look yeah. more and you know I kind of think you know you've got to get into your fridge to not waste it because otherwise things just fester oh absolutely yeah 
Yeah, and I think you're so right. But I think the thing is with food, just have fun with it. It never has to be perfect. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's just like get in there and start cooking. And, you know, I make so many mistakes. Some things are delicious. Some things just never work out. But it doesn't really matter. It doesn't. I often feel that people have a lot of fear around cooking. Yes. Well, it, well, it, it reminds me of why Russell Norman named his restaurant Bruto, which is that Italian phrase, yeah. which is ugly but good. Yeah. And it's the idea that the brown home cooking of Italy is some of the buone, yeah, yeah which is some of the most delicious food yeah. it doesn't have to look beautiful no it, but if it tastes good that's all that yeah. matters yeah I, I totally agree with you for me if you're into nature this idea about the food that's grown in the soil that we end up in there's an importance of that this miracle that is the food that keeps us alive that grows in the soil yeah. and you have that relationship with your growers don't you with fern barrow i i do i feel very very grateful to have this really extraordinary relationship with a woman called jane scotter who's a wonderful grower she has a farm called fern barrow which is in the black mountains in herefordshire and we've been working together for this is our 10th year now and i was very inspired by a trip to california in 2011 where i went to visit quite a lot of restaurants that had unique relationships with farm and I thought I really wanted that and just how deeply creative that was and also how connected you know because I think we're and I'm sure you're the same I'm only inspired by produce and beauty and what's growing like that is my greatest creative kind of I see something that's beautiful and that inspires me to cook something with it but we have a lovely relationship and she farms in a biodynamic which is a Steiner method of farming that is actually the oldest and original organic movement which started in 1924 from a group of six lectures given in one day so it's the centenary of biodynamics next year but that came as a reaction where a lot of farmers came to Rudolf Steiner who was just a really big thinker actually really noticing the difference in soil health with the industrialization and the increased use of fertilizers and pesticides I'm with you I think that incredible everything comes from the earth and and so it returns you know which is kind of this true kind of cycle of life so Sky how do you work with Jane at the farmer how do you, how's your relationship work? It's a lot of work. And I think all good things are hard work, aren't they? But it's a very different relationship than ringing up our suppliers at 11 o'clock after the end of service, going down, seeing what's in the fridges and then topping up or whatever we do at the end of every year. So round about now, between like November and December, we'll sit down and we'll review the year. We've had a tough year this year, actually. I think probably a lot of farms. I was speaking to some other people, you know, we've had such a wet summer. The seasons were so late for everything. But, you know, we think what worked, how did the year go, what worked, what we loved what we didn't love so we review the year and then we it's actually amazing it's like being with a shopping catalog we have all the beautiful kind of seed catalogs and we go through them and choose what we want to grow in order for it to be viable for both of us and one of the most essential things to me when, when we set out to do this I wanted to prove that little farms could thrive and be viable and so you know we do have conversations around price and delivery days and all of those things we choose everything we want to grow for the year some things work some things don't you know England's a real little microclimate actually because I work with two farms one in Berkshire Hampshire border and one right up in the Black Mountains and the soils are completely different I mean Jane's soil she's been growing biodynamically for 29 years it's the most beautiful soil and the farm at Hetfield we only received biodynamic status in 2019 we went organic first and biodynamic the soil of that area is quite clay anyway and we've seen a huge improvement because we've been moving towards it for a decade really wow. before we got the certification and it is improving but it's much warmer down there it's much flatter we can grow aubergines chilies and jane grows beautiful that they completely different you know and they come into you know tomatoes are ready at heckfield a long time before they're ready at jane's but it's a very beautiful relationship it's very it can be really challenging you know when you have bad years this year has been a bad year and i was actually speaking to the guys from shrub who connect all the small re regenerative farms and deliver them to restaurants which has been a huge game changer but everyone's had a tough year i think in terms of farming but it feels like really important work I always feel like when we do it together it's incredibly important what we're doing it's very creative and it's very beautiful you know like the produce we get it's just like it's just it just keeps us going actually I believe passionately in good clean soil and that includes animals raised on beautiful clean pasture that whole demonization of dairy fails to look at the importance of mixed farming if yeah. you want clean soil and not to cover your soil in pesticides herbicides insecticides which are killing all our diverse species and insects and animals so small amounts of dairy you don't have to drink four liters a day 
but small amounts of good quality dairy is good for the planet and good for your body, for nutrition. And I think for me, that whole holistic way of looking at food, that it's doing you good. You mentioned to me before about the omega health giving properties of good dairy. But I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. I feel like sometimes I, I spend a lot of time defending dairy and animals. And I feel like people don't understand that, you know, small dairy herds, particularly raised on good, clean pasture, are really good for carbon sequestration and for the planet so they're actually a really positive I think sort of mass production of dairy and feedlots and things are not I think maybe you could say again because I found that so fascinating about the health of milk and dairy from small farms as opposed to well I think it's what we have to start thinking about is what did the animals we eat eat yeah because if we want to have healthy food we've got to start thinking about what those animals at and also about their life whether they had a stressed out life because it's all part of the same system animals on mixed pasture the type of food they were grown evolved to eat are full of omega-3s which are really good for us and when they are indoor reared on grain they have a full of omega-6s which are the fats that we have too much of which are now no longer as good for us because the ratio of fats in our body is so out of kilter so it's much better for you to have grass-fed milk or grass-fed dairy or it's just better for us. So again, it's just thinking, rethinking about how we eat. If we eat less of it and it nourishes more, we don't crave it so much. We have a better relationship with it and we love it more. And it's about pleasure, isn't it, food? Yeah, this is what I love. It's always about pleasure and taste. If it's grown in better soil, it tastes better. You get more from it and yeah. then you're more nourished and then you're more satisfied. Yeah. And then you don't need to keep coming back and back and back yeah because it's not empty i mean i always say too like i think when people ask there's so many questions i think the only question you really need to ask and how does it how has it grown and then i think you can eat a little of what you fancy can't you you know but it's just a question of how your food was where it comes from really when you've got you know a limited amount of ingredients to play with and you're really working seasonally and you're really sticking within buying from small farms you know it really forces me anyway to be much more creative you know and i have to think of a hundred ways to use that squash or 100 ways to use that citrus you know because especially now going into the winter we've got brassicas really what have we got we've got brassicas some pears and apples left over from the late summer harvest and so you know you have to find 100 ways to work with you know like collard greens kale you know hispy like red cabbage like but it's it's beautiful and actually you hone into all the different like the nuances of flavor in all the different varieties so i really enjoy it i find it very confusing if i have a too much i don't want to be a kid in a candy shop you know i want to be kind of much also why would you want to eat a strawberry in the winter when it has no flavor absolutely yeah it has no nutrition and no flavor yeah so in terms of food waste you're already doing a huge amount yeah. because of you know, just that awful statistic of how much food we throw away. But I know you do other things in terms of sustainability too within the restaurant. I suppose the biggest, uh, apart from the food waste, and it actually was a huge thing for us and it, probably the biggest challenge since opening, was as a restaurant at the beginning of 2018, we started working with a woman called Sean Sutherland from the Plastic Planet. And a bit like when I did food waste, I went to a talk that she did and I really heard about single-use plastic. So we challenged ourselves and we went single-use, it took us a year actually, but we went single-use plastic free in the restaurant, uh, which was amazing. And we did it as a team. We all, we allocated different people, you know, we had representatives in the bar and the reception and we did everything from change. Getting rid of cling film would have been our hugest thing yes. and the actual quantities of cling film we use. And funnily enough, you were just giving food waste statistics. I find statistics really helpful in any change. We did the statistics on everything. So we did how much cling film we actually used in a year. And if we rolled it out, it would have gone from here to John O'Groats and back again. Wow. Just one restaurant out of probably about 15,000 restaurants in London. And that's one big city in the world. So you can imagine. That's incredible. Just, yeah. So that was a huge thing for us. We love that. And then we, we've worked in the last two years, we've worked really strongly with the Felix Project. So we do a lot of volunteering and we also give them the venue, I think four times a year for them to be able to raise money. And I've loved that. I find what they do very important and very inspiring. Sky, it's incredible what you're doing here. And I think if more restaurants look at what you're doing and challenge themselves, because I think people think it's impossible. Yeah. And even as consumers, we think, oh, I'm throwing away food, but there's nothing I can do. But actually, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. leaning into a problem and yeah. making it actually quite fun and creative and totally that's, and that's how we can solve it's the got world. to be viable it's got to be authentic and it's got to be creative and fun i personally love challenging myself you know 
otherwise it would just be boring. Like, you know, restaurants can be very monotonous. You know what it's like. And it's good to feel good about yourself. I personally want to feel good about myself. I feel very good that Spring supports an 18 hectare farm in the Black Mountains of Fernbury. That That's good, clean soil. That makes me feel Spring as a restaurant is doing something positive in an industry that is very broken yeah and I think that is the absolute nub of what you're doing you are giving farmers a way to look after the environment through the food you're putting on people's plates yeah and every single one of us every time we eat can be supporting a nature-friendly yeah. way of being and that's what you're doing here and it's wonderful thank you